Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Faith Boosters. Thank you so much for joining me again for another time in the presence of God and in his word. Yes, we are here to change a generation. We are here to change the narrative to truth. Yeah, from deception. We are here to shine the light of God on the children of God, on the sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are here to possess what belongs to us. Faith Boosters is becoming a movement of people, of young people who believe in God. By the way, you can say that you're young. It's not about an age thing. It's a decision thing. Me, I'm young. Yeah. And so it's, it's just bringing us back to truth that we are believers who are under the Lordship of Jesus, who show forth his glory, who make it admirable for people to want to be believers as well, who continue to draw many men back to the Father as he desires because we show forth his glory and we are possessing our inheritance. So thank you so much for joining us. If you're new here, welcome to the family. Thank you for joining us. We are addicted to the word of God. We love to show forth his glory. We get into the word, we discover what belongs to us and we take it. Yes, we take it and then we go and get other people and say, also you take it because in God, it, it doesn't diminish when others take. There's more than enough for everyone. All of us can live glorious lives. And so thank you for joining us. Why don't you go ahead, share the link, tell our friends and family we are live and let's get into it right away as we begin in prayer and in thanksgiving. Go ahead and let's just give thanks to God together. Father, we thank you for another opportunity in your word. Your word is power. Your word is life. Your word is light. Your word is a gift. Your word is a gift to us, oh God, because by it we are instructed. By it we are saved from bad mistakes. By it we are given an inheritance that cannot be, cannot be spoiled, cannot get rotten, cannot be robbed away. By it, Lord, everyone is put at the same level regardless of, 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 of the advantages or disadvantages of how how or where we were born we become people who inherit life in its fullness lord regardless of where we are on which continent so we thank you for your word and as we get into it today thank you for empowering every word we thank you for the light that is coming in our lives as we hear your word and we are walking away better than we came today because your word never leaves us the same in jesus name amen Amen, amen. I'm going to get into it. I have a sweet word on my heart for you today. Um, and, and, and I want us to get into it because it's a lot. This is the thing I want to talk about. I feel like you guys are about to start naming me. <laughs> like I come to debunk lies. It's like there's, there's a certain anointing on my I hate deception, guys, so forgive me. But I'm here to debunk a certain lie that, that, has, that has become, you know, it, it, it has pervaded the believers like we it's one of those things that we've believed as true and i've had so many christians say it and at some point honestly i believed it and it's from the pit of hell of course every lie is from the pit of hell but some of these i feel like they are specially designed and condensed and put together to really really keep us behind as children of god especially and we seem to and and it's one of those things that keeps us held back from the life of god and i feel like once 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 this this light comes on also it will be another ho 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 i've caught you i've caught you devil you're not going to rob me anymore and what is that lie that i want to debunk today there's this deception among christians and i've had and you've probably had this statement before if god wants it for me he'll give it to me do you hear how that sounds it sounds so true and christian and nice it's a lie it's passivity at its worst. It's the devil literally robbing you properly and you participate with him. In fact, you, you, you hand over, you're like, if God wants me to have a good life, I'll have a good life. If God wants it, may I me to have a good family, I'll have a good family. If God wants me to excel in exams, I'll excel. If God wants me to have wonderful children, I'll have wonderful children. If God wants me to lose weight, I'll lose weight. If God wants me to, to be wealthy, I'll be wealthy. If God, do you hear how it sounds? Defeatist. What we do is we take all the responsibility and put it on God and say, mm, ah, me, what can I do? I'm just a small worm. I'm just a grasshopper. 
living on this earth and seeing what if the Lord wills, He wills. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future is for us to see. Oh, Sarah, Sarah. Some of you are like, what am I? I don't know what I'm talking about. It's a bad song I've had my children sing. But basically, we are just there and we folded our arms and we pray and even it it affects how we pray it affects how we live it affects how we think it affects how we work it affects how we relate it affects everything because we have no desire for life we do but we are like why should i even let me ask you something if it's about if god wants me to have it i'll have it why do you have desires and plans eh? why do you have desires and plans because has god told you he wants you to have it how do you discover what God wants you to have? Right. You've answered right. You go to his word. Because he says that through his word and through his great and precious promises, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That should be one of your memory verses. You should hold it on the inside of you until one day it explodes with life. How do you believe it? Because let me tell you something. God has I used to hear a preacher say this thing and I'd be like, hey, God has already done everything. Really, I don't feel it. I feel like God hasn't done everything in my life. Let me tell you something. God has done everything through Christ Jesus. He gave us life in its fullness in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus, when he's dying on the cross, he makes a statement. He said, it is finished. He doesn't call you to now add on to his finished work. If something is finished and you add to it, you're spoiling it. There's something called over, over what? Overkill. Like when you overdo something, I have found someone has painted the house and you add some extra stuff and you're sort of like, that thing was good before, now it's bad because you added stuff to it. Jesus finished your life and my life. He paid fully the price for everything we'll ever need. Then he handed it over to us. Now we are telling him, now also bring it, bring it to me. I, I can't even explain it. It's like cooking food for your child. Then they say, if mommy wants me to eat it, she'll make me eat it. You have to eat it. Like you have to put it in your mouth and actually chew and swallow unless you're sick. It's not normal for you to be being fed by force through a tube. It means you're not well. Okay? So God intervenes from time to time through miracles. Miracles are not the way of the believer. We are not supposed to believe for miracle to miracle. In fact, Jesus says through his word that miracles are for the unbelievers. Miracles are supposed to be to help someone believe. Because when you look at miracles in the Bible, the moment someone got healed, everyone believed. The moment someone knew, everyone believed in Jesus. The moment Jesus multiplied bread, people believed. For you, you already believed. Why should God continue to perform miracles? Come and do what you should do. Oh, you're living from miracle to miracle, miracle. Oh my God, we almost, then the Lord did it. We almost, then the Lord did it. Oh, we almost. Why is, why is almost your middle name? Everything is almost. This happened, then the Lord did it. God wants you and I instead to become the ones who distribute miracles. But we live under grace. Grace is divine enablement. We live under grace, not under miracles. Miracles are for emergencies. So you cannot live under emergency for the rest of your life. We live from grace to grace. From glory to glory. From light to light. There must be a sense of increase and progress and stability in our lives. Because we are the ones providing the miracles. But if the ones supposed to provide the miracles are in need of a miracle and always in emergency. You think you'll ever stop to think how can I help others' lives get better? No. Half the time, not half. 99% of the time, if there is even a 1% chance of not, we'll find that we find ourselves praying for our own miracles because we are in an emergency mode. If God doesn't come through, ah, they are chasing me from the house. If God doesn't come through, I have nowhere to go. If God doesn't come through, my marriage is ending. If God doesn't come through, my kid is driving me crazy. If God doesn't come through, the weight is killing me. If God doesn't come through, the books, uh, the exams, oh Lord God, should we be praying about exams or passing them? Because God said you're the head and not the tail, you choose not to study and say, Lord, if you want me to pass my exams, you will make me. Make me remember what I did not even study. How is God going to make you remember what you did not study? Hmm? So I keep saying God is not a witch doctor. But you guys, I'm not joking. I'm serious. It's like we've got this thing on our lives as Christians where because we've become children of God, we think that that means now we are called to do nothing. There's a thing among Christians called waiting on the Lord. Have you heard it? It annoys me. I tell you, if you do, please don't come to me and tell me you're waiting on the Lord. I think, yes, I know it's biblical, but we misuse it because we don't mean what the Bible means. We, what we mean when we say we're waiting on the Lord is we, means, um, it, we mean I am being passive 
and waiting to see what God does because me I'm powerless. Do you think God called you and I to be powerless to sit there and wait for heaven to move? Perhaps if God smiles upon us, let me tell you we sound like some people I'm going to talk about today, the children of Israel. You know that story? I don't care how many times I read the story of the children of Israel. I see us. I see myself, I see you and I, I see a generation of believers who God, by his mighty power through Jesus Christ, you know, you see Moses, you see Jesus comes, he's, he delivers us from sin, from darkness, from rejection, from depression, from all these evil forces, poverty, what? And then he wants to move us from Egypt, which is bondage, to the land of promise, which is life in its fullness, but we are stuck in the middle. We are delivered from bondage, but we are also not inheriting life. We are there, in between stuck and we are not stuck because god has made us stuck he has given us a leader he has given us his word he's given us promises he's divided up a portion for us to inherit he has showed us a bit of it but we have a problem we are stuck in the middle we are stuck in between bondage and life god did miracles you look it's not about the miracles god does in your life that has to be clear faith does not come by miracles please settle that in your heart Faith does not come by miracles. If it was faith that, that faith came by miracles, the children of Israel would have entered the promised land. Because God performed miracles. Look, the Red Sea parted. They ate food from heaven every day. The clothes on their bodies never grew old or their sandals. For 40 years, they never needed new clothes. God renewed their clothes. He, he, he had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night guiding them. Those guys say, saw meat falling from heaven. Angels baked bread for them. Look, eh? Those guys should have been like, we believe in God, but they did not believe him. And therefore, they did not enter the promise of God, even though God had brought them a leader, delivered them those 10 plagues. I think in your head, they are nothing, but think about it. Those 10 plagues, an entire nation, to the point that children died in every household apart from the children of Israel. God moved heaven and earth, but still, they did not believe him. So your faith is not going to grow by miracles. Some of you think if more miracles happened in my life, once that miracle happens, you will need another one. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is built by the word of God. That's why the enemy doesn't want you in the word. He wants you looking for miracles. You don't want to read your Bible, but you need a man of God to wave a magic wand over you and everything in your life turns around. Sounds like witchcraft. But let's not go there. Yes, Jesus paid it all by grace. I agree. Jesus paid it all by grace. Now, can you receive it? Grace provides, faith receives. He says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, he says, by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Okay? So, yes, you've been saved by grace, but it's through faith. That's why you have to participate even in salvation. Otherwise, all of us should just be children of God by force. If it's, God wants me saved, I will be saved. No, God wants you saved. But if you refuse it, what can he do? The children of Israel, for goodness sake, after he had even killed children in Egypt for them, they still did not make it to the promised land because of their unbelief. I want to expose to you the evil twins of death today. The evil twins of death are called disobedience and unbelief. That's what killed the children of Israel. That's what stopped them from inheriting the promises. And that's what is stopping us. There is nothing new under the sun. Spiritual things are the same. They are evil twins of death called disobedience and unbelief. And they are working in some areas of our lives. Because, listen, I just told you faith does not come by miracles. But some of you think, my faith will grow if I go to a place where I can see limbs growing. No, you just need something more exciting. You need something more exciting to keep exciting your senses. But the people who know their God are those ones who are of faith, who have read his word, believed it, lived by it, and seen it bring, bring to They have exercised that word in their lives, and you can't move them. They don't need a miracle. They know how money works. They don't need a miracle. They know how marriage works. They don't need a miracle. They know how, how what else, what, whatever it is. They know how, how favor works. They don't need a miracle. They know how stuff works in the spirit by principles. But those principles are in the word of God. That's why faith comes by hearing. The things you consistently hear are shaping your belief system. The things you consistently, not the things you hear once a week on Sunday, 30 minutes, someone, and you think you're growing in faith. The things you consistently hear are forming your belief system. Child of God, 
So just because God wants it for you doesn't mean it will come to pass. Otherwise, the whole world would be born again by force. Because God loves all, all of us. He loves, he wants everyone to come to the knowledge of his dear son, Jesus Christ. But God doesn't treat us like slaves where he forces a thing on you. He gives it and then he says, can you receive it as a son and an heir? You're a participant. You're an equal partner. You're created in my image. Let's, let's take over this world together. He doesn't come and take over the world and say, okay, okay, now also you've taken over somehow. No, he says I have. That's why Jesus, even in his miracles, he made them participate. He would tell a blind man, go and wash in a pool. A blind man to wash in a pool means he has to get help, means he's putting his faith to work. He's believing that his eyes are going to be opened once he washes by the word of God that was given to him by Jesus. So he has to go and actually get to, take me to the pool of Siloam. The man has told me that if I wash my eyes, imagine the difficulty that blind man had to go through, but his faith led him. The same Jesus who would tell lepers, go show yourselves to the priests. They still have leprosy and you're supposed to go to the priest when the leprosy has left. The Bible says as they were on their way, they were cleansed. Because they were acting on their faith, he needed them to participate. That, that, that same faith that was in the heart of the woman with the issue of blood. Remember that woman? There were crowds, crowds, so many people were pressing upon Jesus. But it's only her who drew virtue out of Jesus. She drew power out of Jesus because she had an expectation of power coming. She said, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. I apologize for the background noise. It's part of shooting at home. So please forgive us. We, live, we, live, we are many who live here. So guys, that, 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 the knowledge that you are a participant, you're a son, you're an heir, you're a daughter, you participate in the life of the Spirit. He says that he's given us these great and precious promises in the book of Peter. That through these we may become partakers of the divine nature or participants in the divine nature. You've not been called to just by force you are rich. By force, you know, he provides it but you must take it. If I came and provided for you a, a gift, I gave you a gift and you didn't possess it. Does it mean I refused you to use it? It means you refuse to use it. Take it and put it to use. Some of you have things that people gave you and you never used them. You gave them away to someone else. Does it mean that you never received them? So to receive is active. I want you to walk away today knowing that we are participants in the divine nature. We re Receiving is active. Your participation does not create the life of God. That has to be clear. God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness by grace, by his love, by Jesus Christ. You cannot work for it. That's why we have equal ground. We are equal. Whether you are born how, born where, what. In Christ Jesus, we all have the opportunity to live as sons and heirs. We all have the opportunity to tap into the wealth of heaven, which is not only material, but to possess the real life of God. It, that's why I'm here. A girl from a place you've never heard of called Rugoma in Rukunjiri district in Uganda, in a village. A girl who was raised and grew there has the opportunity to speak to you now in even in English. Do you know what helped me? Jesus Christ. Salvation is an equalizer. It's access into the things of God. That we come at level ground, but we will all manifest to the extent that we receive. Remember, we're going to talk about the children of Israel and mirror it to ourselves. Your participation does not create... It does not gain you favor with God. Participating does not make you favorable to God. God doesn't favor you more when you participate. It is simply proof of your faith. Faith receives and receiving is active. Faith receives and receiving is active. This is a thing that I wish someone had taught me when I was younger in the faith. Because I used to wonder, what is this thing called faith? How do you receive? They would keep telling you, have faith, receive. Have faith, receive. You're like, what does that even mean? Okay, I receive. Let me wait on God. If he wants me to have it, I will have it. No, that's passive. That's passive. It's from hell. Where you're like, mm -hmm. if you want me to enter the promised land, I'll enter the promised land. It's not up to God. It's not up to God. How much of the Christian experience you encounter in your life with God is not up to God. It's up to me. It's up to you. All of us. That's why we are all fighting a fight of faith. Our fight, remember we're going to look at the children of Israel. They had to fight to possess the land. God would tell them, I have given you victory. Go and fight. Huh? If you've given me victory, why am I fighting? So that you participate. Because you're going to fight only if you believe that God has given you victory. So basically, our participation is our act of faith. 
That's why James says faith without action is dead. You can't say you have faith, but you're taking a negative an, an action in the opposite direction. Ah, I believe, I believe God is my provider, but I can't tithe. I believe God is my source, but I can't give. Uh, I believe God is, is taking care of my relationships, but I'm going to cohabit. Or I'm going to play five different men or, or women. I believe God is the author of marriage, but I, I don't believe in marriage. I believe... What other things do we say we believe? Basically, if you believe it, where is your action of faith? Because the children of Israel, God, with all his power, he really displayed power. But imagine those guys never made it. Not because God was unwilling, but because they had unbelief. And I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures. So that lie that God, if God wants it for me, he will get it to me. It is exactly that, a lie from hell. Because God wants it, <laughs> God wants it for you. He has got it to you. Now reach out and receive it. Don't be passive. God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to have great relationships. He wants you to have wisdom, favor with God and with men. He wants you to be happy and joyful. He wants you to enjoy a life in its fullness. He wants you to be to have strength in the midst of adversity. He wants you to be wise. He wants you to stand out in your generation. But he's not going to come and get you and make you get take it by force. You are the one who has to take what is yours. You see when you realize it was given. Huh. and paid for, you start to take it by force. But if you don't even realize that God wants this for me, how can you fight for it? God doesn't just want it for you, he has given it. You, I can want something for you, but I'm not able to give it to you. God is able, he is willing, he has done his part. You and I now must appropriate the things that are ours like sons and heirs. Let me give you another example. If your father died and you found out that he left behind an inheritance for you, a big plot of land somewhere maybe, and you found someone building on it, would you be like, ah, if my father wanted it for me, I guess no one would have built on it. Huh? You go to court, you pull out the documents, you say this is my thing, I can't allow these people, it's illegal. Why? You realize your father gave it to you, it is yours, you can't take it by, by, by passiveness. You have to participate as a son and a daughter. You have to go to court, take the names, change the things, get it back, fight, pay money, involve lawyers. That's the same thing. We get into the word of God and say, why do I have sickness in my body? When the word of God clearly says, in, there's a scripture in Psalm 91 that I saw recently when my baby had started showing signs of, of colic. I said, hey, 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 hey. I, I called my sister. I told her, give me my Bible. Let's pull out the medicine because the Bible says that the word of God is health to all our bones. And she was screaming the whole day. My mind has started saying, hey, I, think, I know these are signs of colic. I remember them in one of my children. I was even going to call someone to bring me some medicine. Then I said, what am I accepting? Jesus paid fully for health. No. So there's this verse you've probably never thought about. In verse 4, Psalm 91, it says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Then this verse, part, part of the verse says, His truth, His truth shall be your shield and buckler. It popped for me that day. God's truth is my defense. I went and researched what is a shield, what is a buckler. A shield is the big protective gear that they used to use in old times when they used to fight. The big one where you can hide behind it. Then the buckler is the little shield on your arm for, for, for uh, you know, combat, which is one-on-one -on -one combat. In other words, you're protected from the big arrows coming from far away and then you're protected from the ones coming near you. You have the big shield and you have a buckler. And he says it's the truth of God that is both your shield and your buckler. But you know that a shield, if you keep it at home, you can't say, if the shield wants to protect me, it shall protect me. You have to engage that shield. You, you take cover under it. When you're fighting in combat, you use the like buckler to protect you. You can't say, buckler, protect me. If the buckler is meant to protect me, you're going to die with your shield and your buckler because you refuse to engage them. If we don't engage the truth of God, we will not see the rewards of the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. First of all, you have to know it. Then after that, start using it. How do you use it? How do you receive? You start to take hold. If God has said it, it is mine. I receive it. I speak it. I decree it. I, I, until I believe it with all my heart and all my soul and all my might. 
But let me show you what, what, what is in, the, in, in Psalm 78, verse 40 and 41. About the children of Israel, which is you and me. We are now the children of God, because they represent us. Verse 40 says, how often they provoked him in the wilderness. They're talking about God, the children of Israel. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. What? You can limit God? Mm -hmm. How? They did not remember his power that day when he redeemed them from the enemy. And it goes on to talk about the things he did. When he worked his signs in Egypt, his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned their rivers into blood, their streams that they could not drink. That's talking about how these people, the children of Israel, forgot or did not, were not aware of what God had done for them. And that limited the power of God in their lives. Guys, can you, have you ever stopped to imagine that God actually told Abraham what he would do with the children of Israel, went ahead and sent Moses and and Moses went there and rescued these people through mighty signs which he performed before Pharaoh and then mighty signs in the wilderness. But for some reason, and I'm going to show you a mystery there. Every single time these people encountered difficulty, do you know what they said? Take us back to Egypt. Because that was truly what was in their hearts. All along they were still slaves. They knew how to be slaves. They didn't know how to be free. Why? They had no knowledge of how free men operate. They thought like slaves. They complained like slaves. They acted like slaves. They bickered like slaves. But meanwhile, they were on their way to the promised land, which was for free men. No wonder they could not make it there. A journey that was supposed to last 11 days, according to the scriptures, lasted 40 years. Not because God was limited, but because the children of Israel were unbelieving and disobedient. The twins of death unbelief and disobedience. They work together. You can't have faith and have disobedience. Faith leads you to do crazy obedience. If you believe it, you do it. If you don't believe it, you refuse to do it. So unbelief and disobedience are like Siamese twins. You can't separate them. The same way faith and obedience are actually also like twins. In fact, Jesus says to his disciples in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Because faith and love work together. So this lie, if God wants me to have it, I will have it, it's a lie. Receiving that God life is your part and my part. Stop limiting God through disobedience and unbelief. Stop limiting God through unbelief and disobedience. Actually, I want, I want to say that unbelief comes first. Because if you don't know what God even has for you, of course you can't obey. It's that knowledge is the first thing. Get in the word of God, child of God. Get in the word of God for yourself. Get in the word. Listen to teachings. Read the Bible. Get, become saturated. Turn off that TV. Turn off that social media and first put your nose in the word of God. Get to know what belongs to you. Don't be an irresponsible heir who doesn't know what is in the will of their father but somehow thinks they are going to build an empire. You cannot build on what you do not know, what you don't have. You are to be a good heir, you have to be so conversant with the will of your father that no one can rob you. But we are being robbed because we don't even know what is ours. And then the little that we know, we don't even believe is ours. We think we are being, they're, they're, they're like if you thought that, the, that your, your father didn't like you and saw the will, maybe he's trying to play you. Will you really appropriate what he's doing? You won't. We suspect God all the time. We don't know, we don't believe, so we disobey. So when they tell you, um, Tithe, ah, 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 pastors want to steal our money. <laughs> wow, you, because you don't believe God. You don't believe God. But it begins with knowledge. Had the children of Israel understood and known and said, God, show us pictures. What does the land flowing with milk and honey look like? They were there crying at some point, take us back to Egypt. We miss garlic and cucumber and, and dentist beans. What? How can someone cry for... And some of you, the stuff that you're crying for right now, that you, that you, Kale, before I got saved, I used to really enjoy life. Like when we ask you what you used to enjoy, it sounds like garlic and cucumber and beans. Yeah. So let me tell you some lessons that I've seen from the Israelites. And I had to write them down so I don't get distracted. First of all, they left by the word of the Lord through Moses' obedience. And they did not arrive in the promised land because of their disobedience. You can live because of the obedience of someone else. Someone came and preached. 
and you got born again and after that you stayed stuck born again and stuck that's a very bad t-shirt never wear it born again and stuck that's very bad because you're a frustrated person because you have a clue that there's a good life promised but you can't see it you're stuck in the wilderness rotating around the same mountain same mountain same mountain for guys 40 years is a long time and for some of us that's like we also have been around the same stuckness in our Christian walk for so long. We are frustrated and we are pointing to God and saying, God, why don't you give me a breakthrough? And he's saying, my child, why don't you take what I've given you? Why don't you take what I've given you? Even him is frustrated. He wants, he has, a, he has given you an inheritance. You're living outside of it. Huh? So they, they did not arrive. Just because God promised it does not mean you will inherit it. Your obedience counts. You are a participant. That's the first thing I want you to remember. Because look, an entire generation never made it to their destination and their destiny that was set by God 400 years before because of their disobedience. God appeared to Abraham 400 years before the nation of Israel was being rescued and said, your children will suffer for 400 years in this land. After that, I will rescue them. And he had planned for a young man called Moses who he sent to rescue them with wondrous signs, but they still miss their destiny because of disobedience and unbelief. That breaks my heart and I can imagine the heart of God that I can miss my destiny because I do not know, I do not believe, and therefore I disobey. It means that I have a part to play. I have to know what is mine. I have to believe it and I have to take it by obedience. There is a way that we have to live as Christians to be able to experience the life of God. You can't just live a certain way and expect the results to show up this way. It's like planting tomatoes and you expect mangoes to come out. It's witchcraft. It doesn't exist. Disobedience will cost you your true inheritance in Christ. But disobedience is a result of unbelief and lack of knowledge. So how do you solve the problem? We are getting there. How do you solve the problem? Get to know what belongs to you and get so saturated with it that that now it is you believe it because the things you believe it's because you had the things over and over that you believe them there's some stuff you've believed that you know now you found out after many years was not true you are so shocked why someone you trusted told it to you so trust the word of god because if you don't this is the story how they provoked him in the wilderness they grieved him god is grieved Again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How? They did not remember his power. We can limit God. He wants to take us to the promised land. We get stuck in a place of miracles. Manna, quail falling from heaven, crossing the Red Sea. That's where many of us are. Miracle after miracle. Emergency after emergency. When God wants to take us to grace upon grace. A land. That's why the moment they entered the promised land, the Bible says manna ceased. The miracle stopped when they entered their inheritance. If you're still living from miracle to miracle, you've not entered your inheritance. Not yet. Because in the place of inheritance, things grow. Things are fruitful. You have abundance. There are systems in place. There are principles that produce. So as long as I still see places in my life where I'm still in emergency, I've not yet reached my inheritance in that area. And it's not up to God. I need to find it in the word of God. I need to believe it with all my heart until it becomes my new normal. The renewing of your mind leads you into transformation. Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will offer proof of what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And we've talked about all those things. You can end up settling for less, or you can end up stuck in your experience of the God life because of unbelief. Remaining stuck in your old way of thinking, even though you're now a new creature with the same mind, because where the mind goes, the man follows. You remain stuck because of how you think. I just told you the children of Israel, the truth is that the, where the mind goes, the man follows. The, the, in their minds, they were still slaves. Think of all the times when they couldn't find water, take us back to Egypt. Oh, hey, take us back to Egypt. Food. Hey, we don't like manna anymore. Take us back to Egypt. We feared say, sin, sin, Sinai, or Sinai, or Sinai, whatever you want to call it, the mountain, when God showed up with the Ten Commandments. Take us back to Egypt. You brought us here to kill us until Moses said, God, kill me. I'm fed up of these people. I can't lead them. If you love me, kill me. 
Can you imagine your leader crying like that? If you love me, kill me. I can't leave these people anymore. He, he also, I think, couldn't understand. These men are slaves. Now Moses had lived as a free man. He grew up in a palace. That's why God chose Moses to go back to the same palace where he had been raised. He could face a king. He didn't have the mindset of a pauper. What's your mindset right now? Do you really, is your mind filled with the promises of God? Are you at least at that place where there is knowledge and you're moving towards belief from just knowledge? Where you saturate yourself until you have a new system in place of how you think about life? I used to think about life through a lens of lack. There's never enough. Lord, provide for us. Lord, 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 Lord. <laughs> My mind got, and it's still being renewed. I'm not at where I need to be. I'm not in the perfect will of God. I'm probably in the good or in the acceptable. But I am offering proof. I don't know when I last worried about money. And it's not about what I do for work. I have a provider. It moved from knowing God is a provider to he's my provider to, hey, I cannot lack. I can't. I can't be poor. I can't lack. And that's your portion. That's my portion. I'm not unique. But it comes by the renewing of the mind. And that's just one of the areas. There are so many things that we must renew our minds to in truth and those leading to obedience. Disobedience is usually rooted in our way of thinking. It's rooted in unbelief. Before you try to obey in your strength, try getting saturated with the knowledge of God's will because you're probably listening to me and you're like, okay, I'm going to go and do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop, I'm stop, stop, stop cohabiting. I'm going to start being patient and kind. No. Get to know who you are because you live from who you are. When you, are, when you become one with what the word of God says, the fruit of it is that that stuff is a result. Don't follow the result. Plant the seed. Get in the word. Listen to the script. Listen to the word of God. Read the word of God. It's, in, it's there in, in, in Proverbs chapter 20 from verse 4. My son, hmm? he says, you do what? Be give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Basically, it starts to tell you what to do. How to be in the word of God. So that, so that, so that because, it's because they are alive to those who find them and health to all their flesh. And it says, above all else, guard your heart. Because from it flow the issues of life. So disobedience is a result of something. It's rooted in unbelief. It's rooted in lack of knowledge. You're not disobeying because you're bad and you want to make sure you live a bad life. No one is doing that. All of us want to live the good life. But we are trying to do the thing that we know because we, what we don't know, we can't do. So get in the word. And I know you're doing it by being on faith boosters. But also beyond faith boosters, get in the word with you and the Holy Spirit. There are things he will show you so that this is just extra. You understand? We are, we are, we are lighting each other's candles. It's not the one coward you hear once a week. One meal a week cannot sustain a man. You become mal malnourished. And you'll need medical treatment. And that's what is happening to some of us in our work with the Lord. Disobedience is rooted in just lack of knowledge. How we think, our belief system, which is rooted in what we've had over time. So get saturated with the knowledge of God's will. And God wants you to participate. While you are a son, you are a daughter. Israel had to fight to be able to possess. They, had, they, they, they could not just, they had to keep food. Remember when they were told, don't get extra. On the Sabbath, God will give you extra food. You know, Jesus, the thing we talked about, God has called you to be participants partakers in the divine nature. God is waiting for your participation. Actually, God is not waiting for your participation. Your inheritance is waiting for your participation. God gave it. It's there. They've given you the will of your father. You've never opened the will to know what is yours. How are you going to appropriate it? You're a bad heir. We have become bad heirs because we don't even know what is ours and then the little we know we don't believe it and therefore we don't obey. So because obedience is the end of faith. That's how you know you have faith. It's obedience. It's obedience is the end of your faith. When you take the action, it means you have believed that what, what that thing is yours and it's what God says is true. You, until I've obeyed, I've not believed. But obedience is a result of faith. You can't chase obedience. If you start trying to do obedience without knowledge, that is works and it will not last. It will be short-lived. So the children of Israel, first of all, they... They left, the prom they, left the they left slavery but never made it to the promised land. Not because God was unwilling, but because they were unbelieving. Okay? And I'm going to show you another scripture here before I get into the two other things we're learning and we'll be done. In Hebrews 3, from verse 12, 
The writer says, beware. Now, when you see the word beware, it means that there's danger. He says, beware, brethren. He's talking to believers, not unbelievers. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of, what do you think the next word is? What's an evil heart of what? Adultery? An evil heart of murder? An evil heart of, no, he says, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Can you imagine? But exhort one another daily, which is what we are doing here, exhorting one another. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened. Have you heard? Unbelief hardens you through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. Partakers, participants of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You take the promise by faith and patience. We talked about that already in Hebrews 6, 12. Faith and patience. And then he goes on to talk about in verse 16. He talks about the children of Israel who, having heard, they rebelled. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? God. God was angry with them. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey? Have you seen unbelief and disobedience again? The evil twins of death. God, these people ended up dying in the wilderness after 40 years of rotating. They never entered the promise, which is the, which is the, the story of many believers. They get born again, they live miserable until the day they die. What pain God must feel. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter. Not they did not. They could not. In other words, it's not possible. You cannot enter into the promises of God with unbelief. You can't. You can go to church every Sunday. You can pray. You can fast on prayer mountain. You, but if you don't believe, you cannot enter. Can you imagine that? How does faith come? Faith is the opposite of unbelief. Faith comes not by miracles. Faith comes not by your man of God. Faith comes not by prayer and fasting. Faith comes not by I don't know what other spiritual exercise you're engaged in. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Obedience is based on the word of God. Obedience is the end of your belief. Your actions, are especially the actions under pressure, show you the thing you truly believe. Because the children of Israel, you could tell when they were under pressure, that's when they would say, take us back to Egypt. That's when you would know what is really in their hearts. Under pressure, how do you react? What comes out? Do you go back to that boyfriend? If things are tight, do you call on those guys you were the two thing and you're like, okay, God, you failed to come through? I really... Yeah... You know what? Have you ever been in a situation where you, you say you are believing God for something, then it didn't happen, then you say, I knew, I knew it wouldn't happen. Yeah, that's why it didn't happen. Because you actually knew it wouldn't. It is your faith that receives. It's not up to God. God is not, is not withholding anything from you and I. Whatever limitations I have in my life, I have set them. And that's a painful truth that I have to embrace in my life. But that helps me to say, where can I, what am I missing, Lord? Because you've given it by grace. You love me. What am I missing? I know you're not withholding anything from me. So in the tough times, I run to him, not away from him. Because I know that he's not withholding. We could, they could not enter because of unbelief. We will not enter if we have unbelief. He says, therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. And then he starts talking about how the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Listen. But the word which they had did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who had it. Let me read that again. Hebrews 4, verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they had did not profit them. Temari Magoba. Did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who had it. The end of your faith is obedience. In other words, you hear the word, you don't take any actions, it will not promise, it will not profit you in any way. When you hear the word, do something, take a faith action, do, take, make, take a faith action, help your 
system receive that word of God as true. Listen to it over and over and over. There are some ones I've listened to until I can almost preach them because something has to break in my belief system. I have to believe that thing. It has to become my way of thinking and start to confess it. So the first thing is that just because God wants it for you does not mean you will have it. You must participate. Possessing involves fighting. Possessing. But this is the thing. The second thing I want to say is that to possess is, is to fight. To possess involves fighting. But the fight is a fight of faith. It's a fight of believing. <laughs> the fight is not a fight of trying to make something work. Do you understand? Like you're not the one making it happen. No. It's a spiritual thing. It, 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 it is that your fight is, is, is the fight of putting the word of God into your system and believing what God has said against all hope. That's the fight. The fight is a fight of faith. You can't use your slave mindset to inherit as a king. You have to allow your mind to be transformed. You have to let the word of God change the way you think. Because remember what we talked about last week, until your mind changes, your experience does not change. A changed mind equals a changed experience. The same mind equals the same experience. That's why the children of Israel had the same mind even though they were in a different place, that's why they stayed stuck and never entered their inheritance. It will not be your story. You will enter your inheritance in the name of Jesus. You will allow the word of God to change how you think. And in your generation and in mind, we will manifest the glory of our Father in heaven. We will, they will see who we belong to. Our light will shine. Yes, God did not light you, you up to put you under a basket. That's not who God is. He does not light your, put, make your light shine, then put you under a basket. He makes your light shine that you may be a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden from sight. It glorifies God when you prosper in every area of your life. Am I saying you'll never have trouble? No, but you're different under trouble. Even during chaos, you're steadfast. And that, that you can be the person who says, count it all joy when I go through trouble. Not that you're happy to be going through stuff, but you're like, devil, attack all you want. I go from glory to glory. You hit me hard, I bounce higher. That's the attitude of faith. Am I saying I'm always like that? Not always, but I've now learned to bounce back quickly. When I start entering that zone, I jump out. Because that my faith is under attack. Our fight, possessing equals fighting. If you're a believer who is waiting for the Lord to come and fight everything, how does he fight? He fights through your faith. The more you build the fortress of faith, God has the opportunity to come and deal with the things you can't deal with because your faith receives. You have an expectation of good. I now have an expectation of consistent progress. You cannot, I can't explain to you, I cannot fail. I cannot fail and I can't be stuck because it is written that I go from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from light to light. Hey, and that's your story as well, child of God. I cannot. You can't use your slave mindset to inherit as a king. You must be willing to change your mind. And how do you change your mind? What you hear most consistently becomes your mindset and determines how far you go in the God life. The children of Israel remain stuck. The children of Israel remained stuck. To possess, you must fight. First of all, remember, you must participate. Just because God wants it for you doesn't mean you will have it. Secondly, you must fight to possess. The fight is a fight of faith. What does he say in, in Isaiah 54, 17? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. But we only know that one. Let's read before, before he talks about how no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What does he say? Hmm? He says, starts talking about single barren one. What, what he's telling, he's speaking prophetically to the children of Israel. Then he says, let's start. I don't even know where to start from. Let me read from verse 11. Isaiah 54. Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. Ah, now you're God, you're extravagant. I'll make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. My goodness. What a promise of extravagance to those who are afflicted and tossed with tempest. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. How many? All. That's my word. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble. He's saying trouble will come, but not because of me. 
Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. Then he says, now listen, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, who shall condemn? You. Who shall condemn? You. Who shall condemn? You, not God. You can't sit there and say, God, condemn them. No, he's saying, you condemn. You're the one who has the power. You shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. This is our heritage. We have the power. You have to open your mouth and condemn every weapon that comes. But how will you condemn when your heart has nothing in it of faith? Your heart, the arrows that you use to fight back the enemy, it's the word of God. It has to come from the deposits of your heart. You open your mouth and say, when your children are starting to misbehave and be weird, you have bad reports coming. You say, my children are taught of the Lord and great is the peace of my children. When you're a wife and maybe you have no more favor before your husband, you start to declare, I am an excellent wife. I am a crown of my husband. I have favor before him and before God. A hey, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but I am a woman who fears the Lord. I shall be praised. I shall be praised by my husband. I shall be praised by my children. I am blessed. I'm highly favored. What happens when you're at school, you're starting to fall back. I have the mind of Christ. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I cannot go backwards but forward. We start to declare those things because when you're faced with problems, with things that are contrary to the will of your father, you get violent and speak back what is true. You're not convincing yourself. When you find someone on the property which your father left for you, you're not convincing yourself that you're the owner. You know you're the owner. And based on that knowledge, you fight. Based on the knowledge that it is yours, you fight. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe that these things are yours, you won't fight back. I'm telling you from experience. If, you, if deep down you don't believe it's yours, you won't fight. You'll be like, mm, anyway, ah, that's how life is. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I guess now I'm experiencing some backward progress. You can't call it progress if it's backward. It's regression. Don't accept anything that is not of God. You can't accept to be, to be experiencing a lesser life than you had the year before. Every year is my best year yet. Every year is my best year yet. Every year is my best year yet. Every book I write is my best book ever. Why? Glory to glory. Strength to strength. Brighter and brighter. That's your portion as well. Child of God, condemn. Because the last thing I want to talk about today, what I saw about the children of Israel, is that your mouth, these people, one of the things that kept them stuck, and, and I will show you the scriptures, is that your mouth can be your deliverance, or it will be the one that keeps you stuck, or the one that robs you of your identity. Because you see, there are levels. You can get stuck, you can also be completely robbed. You know that even Moses did not make it to the promised land. His, that was his destiny. He was created for that one purpose, the deliverer of Israel. He never made it. Do you know why? He also disobeyed God. And his was more critical. Watch out for those of you who have had certain levels of encounter with God. There is a greater expectation on you. Because the children of Israel did so many things. God kept forgiving, allowing. Moses, God told him, speak to the rock. But he was angry and he struck it. And God told him, you did not hallow me before the children of Israel. You didn't honor me. You disobeyed me. You did not believe me. I told you to speak to a rock and you hit it. You're not entering that promised land. He begged God. God told him, I don't want to hear it anymore. Don't talk to me about this matter again. In those exact words, do not talk to me about this matter again. He told him, go, you will see it from a distance and then I'll bury you. Can you imagine? It's sad. But even Moses, with all his closeness, remember Moses, he saw God. He spoke to God face to face as a man speaks with a friend, the Bible says. That same guy never made it. Not just because you had deep experiences with God doesn't mean you will encounter the fullness of He still requires obedience. I really believe obedience is the greatest mark of spirituality. I'm telling you, even Jesus is praised by God for his obedience. I believe that obedience is the highest mark of spirituality. That when you don't question what God's word says, he says it is this, okay. I don't, now we have a generation who say, I don't understand it. If I don't understand it, I can't do it. No, you're disobedient and you're outside of the promises of God, you're getting robbed. You have to get a posture of humility where if God says it, I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it. I'll trust you, Lord. We need to go back to that place as believers where we do what God says, whether we understand it, it makes sense, or not what we do it. Because in our obedience is our inheritance activated. 
So the last thing we are talking about is that your mouth is a huge part of entering your inheritance. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. I think that's Proverbs 18, 21 and 22. That life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. We just talked about it in Isaiah 54, 17. That every tongue that rises, tongues, can you imagine that a tongue can rise up against you? The children of Israel, one of the worst things they did, go and read numbers from like numbers 12 up to 14. <laughs> Those people complained, you people. Hmm? The children of Israel complained complained at one point god opened the ground and swallowed an entire family and all their babies and and belongings the moment they finished burying them they started complaining again like i feared the children of israel they didn't fear god they were so used to you see complaining is a mark of slavery in your heart if you it's small people who complain and i'm talking about small people like me i'm small i'm short no Small people, if you're small in your heart, you complain. Big people don't have time for complaining. They're always thinking about the mysteries of God, the big things that God is bringing. It is, it's small people who have time for gossip and complaining because they, are, they have nothing to focus on. But one of the worst things that happened, how you see the children of Israel finally losing their inheritance, is when God, God tells them to go and possess the land. Then they say, can we first send um, uh, 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 12 people to go and spy the land? <laughs> Let me show you the scripture. God didn't tell them to spy the land, but he allowed them. So they go, they send their leaders of their tribes. I believe it's Numbers 13. Let me just go there and check. They go there to spy the land. They get there. They come back with a report which God says was an evil report. They come back and cause fear in the hearts of the people by what they say. That's why you should be careful what you watch and what you hear. It can plant fear in your heart. But chapter 13, you can read all of it and see what happens, how they went there and spied out the land from the wilderness. They went up through the south, ETC. When they departed, they came back to Moses and Aaron, verse 26, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness and brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Those people say, me, I'm telling you, I've seen people in God who experience these good things. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. Eh? They are like, mm, prayer, prayer is hard. Eh, fasting is hard, tithe is hard, waiting is hard. Being saying sexually pure is hard. Mm, it's not easy. The people are very strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anaka there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hita is representing all the. It's very difficult for people not to cohabit. It's very difficult not to not to steal money. It's very difficult not to take bribes. It's very difficult. How do you survive without stealing? It's very difficult. Let's be realistic. It's very difficult. That's the devil robbing you. They started to present the difficulties. Their job was one, go see what God is taking you to. Go see the land God is taking you to. Get into the word of God, see where he's taking you, see what he has promised you. And only concentrate on that because it's what builds faith. The moment you start hearing the report of the devil, unbelief has come. They started naming all the difficulties, how difficult it is to do all these. And the verse 30 says something interesting, Numbers 13. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. He had also gone with them. There were 12 men. One guy said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than us. They gave the, they gave the children of Israel a bad report. The Bible, the other version says, an evil report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom they saw, and then... Then they say something very bad in verse 33, which is what some of us is our biggest problem. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. It begins with how you see yourself. They saw themselves as grasshoppers, and therefore, if you see yourself that way, it's how the world will receive you. I'm telling you, if you see yourself as rejected, you'll be rejected. If you see yourself as, as, as loved, you'll be loved. If you see, and you're saying, that's so simplistic. No, it's the word of God. It's not simplistic. 
the way we see ourselves is the way we will be seen. It's a spiritual principle. Because once, and indeed, after they had said all this, the, the people of Israel lifted up their voices and cried. They compla all complained. Ah, there we go, slaves. Moses even prays for them. What? Tells them, don't rebel against the Lord. They refuse. Eventually, can go. these are things that I would like you to go and read for yourself. God says to Moses, because they have not believed me, none of these shall inherit. He says they will all die. Anyone, 40 years and below, is going to die. And he says, their little ones will inherit the land instead of them. Why? They did not believe me. They came up with an evil report against my promises. Basically, you're saying God is lying. He's taking you there to consume you. God is lying. If you wait, if you wait for marriage, hey, your marriage won't even work. No one will marry you. You have to have sex before marriage. God is lying. If you give of your money to the poor and also tithe and etc., hmm, you're going to end up broke. God is lying. If you click everything that God speaks and there's an evil report against it, it's robbery. What did I tell you this is? They are two, they are, they are twins, the twins of death, unbelief and disobedience. They work together. It begins with unbelief, it leads to disobedience. Don't try to obey. Saturate your heart with faith and obedience will be a result. Because when you believe something, you do it. It's the natural thing. You, you don't work on your obedience to people who you believe in. No, when you believe someone, they tell you something, you do it. When you don't believe someone, you first ask like seven people before you do the thing. Even when you do it, where they can, you live extra. And that's how some of us are with God. We don't trust his promises. That's why we say, if he wants me to have it, he will have it. It's a defeatist thing. David understood, watch your mouth. Watch the report you're giving of your life. The report of my life is clear. I go from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from strength to strength. Nations are opening up to me. Yes, I'm telling you, I am favored before God and before men. That is your story. That is mine. And I believe it with all my heart. And it's manifesting. It's not just about me. Look, there's a man who understood this, and I'm going to end with this. David understood this. David is going to fight Goliath. Do you know what David first does? <laughs> he uses his words. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Eh? Before God, you're going to become nothing. He starts to tell him, this is what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to kill you. Then I'm going to cut off your head. Then I'm going to feed it over to the what? He judges him what he's going to do. He speaks, he uses, because he knows that his words are substance. They go into the spirit realm and creates before he takes action in the natural. Some of us think words are nothing. Words are power. Words have their substance. They are a thing. You know, like how this is a substance. When you see it, you see it. Words are a substance. They create. They go into the spirit realm and create your life. You can create your life five years from now. Now, by speaking the word of God over your life consistently until you see it start to manifest. Yes, you start to declare, I cannot be poor. I cannot be broke. I do not. And then you take faith actions. Generosity is the key towards wealth in the kingdom of God. You start to decree and declare those things. I've seen the difference between even the children have given birth to. The ones we spoke over consistently, by the time they were born, everything was so easy. The ones we didn't speak over consistently, we've had to start speaking now and undoing. It's a spiritual principle. Your words have power. That's why God says to Jeremiah, after he has told him, before he formed you in the womb, he tells him, I've, I've ordained you a prophet. And he says, I am a youth. Ah, Lord God, I am a youth. You think it's cute. God says, do not say I'm a youth. Do not say anything about your life that God does not agree with. And you're going to fail from time to time. I've also failed. But you pick yourself up and undo until it becomes up. But you see, the more you saturate yourself with the word, what's going to come out is what is in your heart. As simple as that. Our words are substance that creates. What, did we, what are we talking about today? That to possess is not passive. To possess the promises of God, we must participate. And how do we participate? By building faith. How do we build faith? By knowing what God says is ours and then over knowing it until it's a belief system and then obeying. Walking in obedience. Doing. Let this become the guide of your life. Let this become the guide of your life. I lived with a man, my grandfather, who, as I find in the scriptures now, everything that was done in that home was about how the, what the Bible said. And no wonder he broke poverty in his entire generation. I don't even have one cousin who is uneducated somewhere in the village. Everyone got educated and were many. He would, they would pick up children, my grandmother, that man, everything, it would be, eh, but the Bible says this, therefore don't do it. So I used to think some things were just his principles until I started reading the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, 
we lived the scriptures in our home. Discipline was based on scriptures. That man possessed. He may not have known nice, glorious words of revelation, but for him, this was his guide for life. He always asked, what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say about how you pay that poor work in your home? It says you should pay them promptly. Lest they cry out to God. I keep hearing people when I meet young women who I'm interviewing to work in homes. They say, I left because they didn't pay me. And many of them are working in homes of Christians. They didn't pay me for six months. I tell you, where do you report a rich woman or a rich man? Can you imagine? What does the scripture say about your pets? There's even a scripture about pets. Those of you who like pets, I don't. Sorry. Everything for life and godliness, the Bible will tell you how to live. But instead, we are consulting Google and the most popular people on Instagram. Then we will have results that we cannot understand. Mixed groups. Get in the word of God. Do what it says before you fully understand it. And you will reap the rewards. Because the farmer who plants seed he does not understand still gets the fruit. They need to understand the science of it. Again, every time I think I end almost the same way, God wants you to have life in its fullness. I used to think that my desire was just so that people can have purpose. But now I now realize that God has placed a small part of his heart in my heart for our generation. That will be the people who see the promises of God come to pass. It's not for a special few. I especially want to, to speak to those of you who have lived a life of pain. You've grown up in misery, in mediocrity. You're, you, you are raised poor, you, with disadvantage. And, and you have that mentality of an orphan of a slave. God wants you to embrace sonship. But it will not happen in one day, one week. You have to start undoing belief systems, patterns that you've embraced so that you may enter the rest of God. You saw that scripture. We saw it together in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4. Hmm? That said that in chapter 3 verse 19, they could not enter because of unbelief. The thing that is going to stop you from entering your inheritance is unbelief. It's not your bad behavior. It's not adultery. It's not bad things you do. Those are covered by the blood of Jesus. And when you enter faith anyway, they fall off. The thing that will rob you of your inheritance, the children of Israel, God didn't punish them for over what. They did all sorts of stuff. They worshipped idols for goodness sake. But God said, you will not enter the promised land because you refuse to believe me. How can you go and say that I'm taking you there to be consumed after everything I've done? How can you refuse to obey my word? In other words, child of God, how can you refuse to obey the word of God? It means deep down you suspect him. Deep down you don't believe in his goodness. But he doesn't blame you. His heart just breaks because what he wants is to give you life in its fullness. It's available for all of us, regardless of our background. So listen. Get in the word of God. Make it your guide for life. Ask yourself every time, what does the word of God say about this issue? Before you consult your best friend and your bo boys and your, I don't know which clique. There's something in here that will make you wiser than your peers. That will give you an advantage in your generation. That will give you the God life that he has promised and given to all his children. But it's there waiting for us to receive it by faith and obedience. And what are the two evil twins of death? Unbelief and disobedience. They work together. Faith and obedience work together. You cannot say you have faith when you're disobedient to the things of God. And faith does not come by itself. It's not some mystery. It comes by the word of God. That's the only path God has given us. You cannot build faith by some other, by laying on of hands. Faith comes by the word. Not by miracles, not by laying on of hands, not by a man of God. Faith comes by the word of God. Through his servants and through his word here, which you should learn to study by yourself. You're loved, you're highly favored. God wants you to have life in its fullness. Take it. Be a participant. Stop being passive about it, waiting for God to do what he expects you to do. He has done his part. Let's receive the promises of God. You're watching me and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. You're missing out. You're remaining a slave when you could be free. There is a life available to you. And so if you're watching me and that's you, don't delay this decision. Just go ahead and do this simple thing. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. So why don't you go ahead and do that with me? Pray this simple prayer after me from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, today I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. 
I believe you died for my sins to give me access to the Father and to a full life. And today I receive it. I break free from bondage. I break free from slavery. I thank you for loving me. Today I am born again. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're born again. Congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. Send us a message on that number that's running on your screen. Let us know what God has done in your life. <laughs> Want to celebrate with you, but also to connect you to a loving family anywhere in the world where we have other believers and to help you understand what has happened and to walk in it. Thank you for watching. The rest of you, you know what to do. Go get in the word because life is in the word of God. Get in the word of God. Do what it says. Share this life-giving message with other friends and family. We'll see you again next week. Same place, same time. You're blessed. Bye.